When my boyfriend and I made the decision to cohabitate this past summer, we agreed that the most equitable approach to decorating our new home would be for each of us to choose several pieces of the other person's art to place into storage. <laughs> and I had my eye on one piece in particular, a large gold-framed quote from the Pulitzer Prize-winning drama Angels in America, which concluded with the phrase, bless me anyway, I want more life. I've always had a mild bias against using quotes as art, so it was an obvious choice for the storage pile. But in the weeks that followed, as I settled into our newly decorated quote-free apartment, I found these words lingering in the back of my consciousness. Bless me anyway, I want more life. Those who are familiar with Angels in America may recall that this line is delivered as the protagonist straddles the boundaries between life and death, a scene that is analogous to the one Jews all around the world experience on this day. Yom Kippur is often understood as the rehearsal for our deaths, a day on which we deprive our bodies of the nourishment required to sustain life clothe ourselves in the color of burial shrouds and recite ancient words often uttered by Jews in the final moments on this earth. On Yom Kippur, we find ourselves in the in-between, written but not yet sealed for another year amongst the living. And that space compels us to engage in an honest conversation about our lives and our mortality a conversation that is mirrored in Moses' final address to the Israelites, the section of Torah we heard read this morning. At 120 years old, Moses is approaching the end of his life, and he assembles the entirety of Israel at the bank of the Jordan River, across from which lies the promised land, to welcome them into the covenant with God as one people. Moses recognizes that accepting and nurturing this covenant will test the Israelites' resolve, but insists that they are uniquely equipped for the challenge. This instruction, which I entrust to you this day, he says, lo nifle'at, it is not too hard for you, velo rechoka, and it is not out of your reach, lo b'shamayim he, it is not in the heavens, velo me'ever le'yam, neither is it beyond the sea. Kikarov alecha chadavar me'od baficha uvilvavcha laasoto. Rather, it is very close to you, in your mouth and in your heart, to observe it. In this passage, the word translated as instruction is mitzvah, commandment, an enormously powerful word in Torah and in Jewish tradition. A mitzvah often refers to a rule or law given by God to the Israelites. But in this particular context, it appears to mean something entirely more personal, something inherent in the Israelites' humanity, a truth that resides wholly within them. Moses continues, Hachaim vehamavet natati lefanecha habracha he says to them, I have put before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life if you and your descendants would live. Biblical commentators often reference this passage as the foundation of free will. The Israelites are given agency over their personal and collective stories, a chance to opt into a partnership with God and a role in the work of creation. But Rabbeinu Yonah, a 13th century rabbi and moralist, contends that these very verses carry a much deeper meaning. According to him, v'charta b'chayim, choosing life, is not merely a suggestion from Moses, but rather a mitzvah in and of itself. This additional commandment is for each Israelite to be a chooser an individual who assesses situations thoughtfully 
and makes decisions based not upon ease or speed, but with an eye towards truth and righteousness and intention. Of course, we recognize this is almost always easier said than done, and a midrash or rabbinic expansion on the text offers an explanation for this challenge through analogy. The Midrash describes a person sitting at a crossroads with two possible paths before them, one with a level beginning and thorn-filled end, and the other a thorny beginning and a level end. To travel down either path means enduring great hardship, but to ensure a conclusion of meaning and content, the person must take on these hardships initially rather than addressing them later on. The Midrash implies that Moses understands the Israelites' covenant with God in similar terms. The laws and commandments required are extensive and burdensome, but through them, a sacred relationship will be born, one that will bless the people and their descendants for generations to come. So too is it with achieving a meaningful and satisfying life one that ends without regret or the feeling of missed opportunities. The mitzvah of choosing life means confronting life's many challenges as a pathway towards a level end, a meaningful conclusion. As the Midrash says, better the end of a thing than its beginning. This summer, I served as a chaplain intern at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles and had the opportunity to work with a number of individuals who understood this particular choice all too well. One of these patients, who I'll call Ari, had suffered a major stroke during the previous year, resulting in very limited mobility, and was also experiencing end-stage renal failure. As a result, Ari's doctors informed him that his life expectancy would likely be limited to a few years. I asked him, what it felt like to receive this news. And after a very long pause, he responded. It's really hard to face your mortality, he said. And there are days when the pain is so severe that I just want to give up, to stop living. But I will not leave this world with regrets. So I'm working to make the most of whatever time I have left. I know that it might be simpler to die but I choose to keep on living. The way Ari spoke about life and purpose was profoundly moving to me, and I was humbled by the courage with which he seemed <clears throat> to be facing this next stage of his journey. I asked what making this choice to, to keep living looked like, and with a gentle smile, he responded, it means I keep on trying. There is so much in life over which we have absolutely no control. Our illnesses and those of our loved ones, strained relationships with family and friends, systemic oppression and historical trauma. We don't decide when we enter this world and the vast majority of us do not get a say in when we depart. But we do get to choose how we live while we live. We get to decide what living a full and meaningful life looks like, and the methods by which we pursue that beautiful and uniquely personal vision. Through my sessions with Ari, I learned that for him, choosing life meant spending more time with his mother, being a better listener and resource to his friends, and finding moments of joy and laughter in every conversation. He wasn't overly concerned with extending his life past what came naturally, but was actively choosing to use the time he had left to try and make the world a little kinder, a little more loving, even if just for the people in his immediate circle. Ari likely did want more life, but what he was fighting for was for his life to be more. A sense of purpose expressed beautifully in the teaching of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov who some 200 years ago said, if you are not going to be any better tomorrow than you were today, then what need have you for tomorrow? Living is finite, 
And the universal truth is that there is almost never enough time. Moses recognizes this deeply. He leads the Israelites out of slavery and travels with them for 40 years in the desert, only to arrive at the promised land and be unable to enter it. A conclusion that is both painful and also very disappointing. Perhaps this is why Moses uses his final moments to teach the Israelites about the mitzvah of being choosers. The charta b'chayim, of actively choosing to pursue lives of meaning and of purpose. He knows better than most that this will not be easy, that the human inclination in moments of adversity is to give up and turn back. We need only look out at the brokenness and pain that permeates our world to empathize with how challenging it can be to choose this path. But Moses insists that the Israelites and all of their descendants, culminating in each and every one of us here today, have been made for this challenge. For this mitzvah, this mitzvah to be choosers is very close to us, in our mouths and in our hearts, to observe it. When we are in the trenches of life, when we are sick or tired, feeling defeated or deflated, it can be excruciating to keep working keep fighting, keep progressing, especially when we know that is not the path of least resistance. Yom Kippur meets us in those trenches, in the space between life and death, and reminds us that we have agency over how we choose to live our lives. We are the proprietors of the paths we choose to walk, and we bear the responsibility for their progression. Will we choose paths that are largely effortless but end in regret, or ones that are rocky and arduous and alive? Created in God's holy image, we were each made with the intrinsic ability to live this mitzvah, to look at our lives as a sacred mixture of the thorny and level, challenge and triumph, pain and joy, and to continue making the choices needed to intentionally move forward into that complexity. To see each difficulty in life not as a barrier, but as an obligation. To continue trying to make meaning, to gain purpose, and to reach fulfillment. Yom Kippur is indeed a reminder of our finitude. But in that reminder lives the glorious opportunity to meet our mortality in friendship. The chance to stare into the unknown and say, I know this life is temporary, and that the journey between now and the end will be filled with many mountains and many valleys. But bless me anyway, with endurance and fortitude and the will to keep on trying. Bless me anyway. I want more life. Gemar Chatimatova.